Hi, I'm your host, Erica Polsonelli, and welcome to Evolve by Erica, the podcast, where we talk all things spirituality, ascension, health, wellness, and beyond. I'm so excited that you are here. Come on in. Hello, guys, and welcome to another episode where I have another dream guest on who is so spiritually aligned. I can't wait to share this with you. It is Danielle from Sakara. She is a co-founder of Sakara. Um, Whitney is the other founder, and I've just been so excited. She was a guest that I've been wanting to have on since the beginning. I'm so excited I got to sit down with her, have a conversation about Sakara, the mission, and how it goes beyond just the plants and the energy. And if you've ever ordered Sakara and eaten Sakara enjoyed any of their products, you just feel this energy that comes along with their food and their community and their lifestyle. And it was just amazing to have this time with Danielle. She's such a beautiful light being. And I feel honored to have had this time with her. And I know you're going to love the conversation. So thank you for being here. And I hope you enjoy it. Hi, thank you for being here. I'm so excited. I'm so happy to be here with you. Thank you. When I first met Sakara, I was like, oh my gosh, brilliant. And this makes so much sense. Mm. It was this fusion to me of everything that made sense. High vibrational food came with Palo Santo. So you're clearing the energy, you're Mm -hmm. setting intention over the food and just living, eating and being intentional. And even the name. Yeah. Thoughts become things, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I was like, oh my gosh, I remember the first box. I was like, this just makes so much sense. I found what I needed. And I'm at the so time I went plant based. And it brought me, it just brought me so much. So I'm so I'm grateful. I'm so happy to hear that because I think, you know, you were most definitely an early adopter to, you know, maybe the connection between, you know, vibrations, food, vitality, spirituality. And, you know, we've been putting Palo Santo in delivery since 2011. Wow. <laughs> I think for a long time people were like, what, what is, is stick? this stick? <laughs> and why is it? There's a mistake. Should I eat this? That's so <laughs> funny. Yeah. But wow. the intention was always helping people recognize your relationship to food um, by taking a moment either for gratitude or recognizing this is a moment of nourishment, an opportunity to um, honor your worth, you know, honoring, feeling really good, and also honoring what it took to get to that place where you have a beautiful meal in front of you. Um, And, you know, I think now people are really familiar with Palo Santo, but still, maybe the purpose is lost because mm-hmm. um, I think it's really hard to slow down in that way in, in this day and age. So, but the intention is still that. Yeah. And it's so true that each meal captures beauty. When you think of food being either taken out from somewhere or delivered, it doesn't usually sustain the aesthetic appeal and mm. every Saqqara meal. I'm like, how is it this beautiful? And the vibrant colors, like I'm thinking about that butterfly bowl. Yeah. And then the tricolor quinoa, which <laughs> yeah. I thought should have been named the mermaid bowl because I mean, look oh, at those colors. Oh, that's a good idea. Like, this is literally we take the naming colors suggestions. Of <laughs> but that bowl was unbelievable. And the colors, you just, what I love the most is that I feel like I'm getting things I wouldn't typ- typically consume yeah. or get if I was making my own food. I'm a creature of habit. I stick with what I know. We all and are. Yes. Yeah. And, and by it's... ordering, you're getting these ingredients I would never typically cook with. Yeah, even if you have the utmost kind of intention and um, kind of hope for your nutrition status, like making this food for yourself for breakfast, lunch, and dinner every single day is nearly impossible in our yeah. world because we're just too busy. We have too many things on our plates, um, you know, sourcing all those ingredients, making sure they're all organic, cooking it, um, and then like the cleanup, it's just like, it takes so much time. So we always tell people, you can think of us as, you know, your nutritionist and personal chef in one. And you're right. There is a huge difference between what we do and what a restaurant does. I mean, we could talk for hours on the nutritional differences, but even operationally, even when I order from my favorite restaurants, it's nowhere near 
as good as if I'm eating it in the restaurant. And it's because they are not in the business of delivery. So every time we innovate on a meal, you know, on a new recipe, delivery is a component of our innovation. So we have to solve for delivery and how it will be delivered in the innovation process, which is very specific to being a direct to consumer delivery business as compared to a restaurant where 98% of their revenue comes from in-person consumers. Um, and then they like just delivery off of caviar, whatever you order off of. Um, it's, it's a very different business operationally. Even how you separate like the toppings to mm -hmm. the salad or the burger from the yeah. salad. It's just all... knowing what needs to stay crunchy and what, yeah. I mean, honestly, it's like all one big like chemistry lab. <laughs> It's incredible. in our kitchen. It is incredible. So you mentioned that it's like working with a nutritionist and a chef because you do have that. Don't you have a team of people yeah. who are putting the – can you talk to that a little bit? Yeah. I mean, so we have, you know, in-house um, registered nurse. We have in-house dietitian. Um, you know, I'm a nutritionist. I'm also getting my master's in functional medicine. Um, you know, Whitney has also been studying this and is a holistic health coach. Um, so every meal is based off of our pillars of nutrition. Um, and there's nine of them and, you know, none of it is rocket science. It's all the things we know deep down that we need to be doing with our health, like getting enough greens, getting enough clean protein, getting the right kinds of fats, um, getting a variety of colors. But just because it's not brain science to know what we need to do doesn't make it easier to actually do it, Absolutely. which is why we started it. You know, we started it because eating this way changed our lives and, you know, it's really saved my life. And then it was like, well, how am I going to keep doing this every single day? <laughs> <laughs> like, okay, like I, I, you can sit on the precipice of knowing this is what you must do for your health and also realizing you can't, like you physically can't make the time um, to do it. So that was why we started it was, we thought there must be at least one other person out there that has been through some version of what I've been through and needs this food as much as I need it. And so we can't just write a cookbook or a blog because that didn't change our lives. What changed our lives is having the food in front of us, ready to eat, no questions asked. It's like you don't have to do anything except enjoy it. I love that. I've noticed over the years that it's, I feel, and you can correct me and anyone else listening can correct me if they feel I'm wrong, but... I feel like it's harder to have more of a plant-focused meal that's home-cooked because the vegetables require really good washing and then sometimes peeling and then chopping yeah. and then cooking some of it. And my husband is more of a gym protein bodybuilder mm -hmm. diet guy mm -hmm. where I'm making like chopped um turkey chopped meat for him and rice and I'm like yeah well that's a lot easier <laughs> but that's not how I eat I yeah eat, like my vibrant plants and I start to see the difference I'm like wow it does take a lot of time and that's why I don't have energy to cook a lot because and a lot of money I mean, and a lot of money well you're, you're yeah. gonna eat an entire cauliflower no you're probably right. gonna eat half of it and then are you when are you gonna cook the rest and it goes bad and it's like so true yeah and you're also speaking to something that is really important that I think you know, a lot of people who know about Saqqara don't know, which is, you know, we're not promoting veganism as a nutritional therapy per se. What we're promoting is a plant forward diet. And when we started talking about plant based, nobody knew what that meant. So we really were part of, you know, the movement of defining what plant based meant. And in my opinion, it was never meant to be another word for vegan. We don't need another word for vegan. You know? <laughs> like vegan can just be vegan. Yeah. Plant based is really you base your diet off of plants. Mm. So that's still our ethos at Sakara. It's my personal nutritional philosophy. My entire plate is based off of plants, um, but there's nothing that I don't eat and I really listen to, to body intelligence on what my body's craving. And you're exactly right. It's so much easier to whip up, you know, a salmon filet mm -hmm. than it is to create a, a rich in diversity plant forward meal. And so our goal was always to provide the hardest part of your diet. And, you know, I will go months at a time of only eating Saqqara. And then, you know, there'll be times where I want to add things to my Saqqara dinner for months at a time. Um, but it's really cultivating that inner knowing, that body intelligence. And the more plants you can get into your diet, the more you will be able to hear that inner voice because you are building up the good bacteria. I mean, there, it's it's not a you know, a misnomer when we say listen to your gut. 
And I always say, like, listen to your gut if you've been taking care of your gut. Um, and so getting enough of the right plants into your diet is the number one indicator to a healthy gut, a healthy microbiome. It is so true. My whole journey to where I am now started by becoming plant-based. Mm -hmm. And that was the first time I heard my inner voice mm -hmm. after being plant-based for probably a month. It wasn't very long, yeah. but it kicked in. It's fast, right? Oh my God. Yeah. And I was like, I just remember being on the boardwalk. I recently had moved to the beach. I changed my diet and I got this message. I had to start meditating. And I remember looking out at the sunset. I'm like, was it always this beautiful? <laughs> and I'm like having this moment with nature. Yeah. And I was like, wow, this is, I never expected this. I never expected it. I want you to take us back to the very, very, very beginning. Yeah. The beginning of Once it all. Once upon a time. Yes. Um, I definitely want to go there. One thing I just want to say, I had this guy, Graham Nichols, on the podcast. And if you haven't listened to that I episode. I haven't listened to that one. It's well worth it. He is a um, astral traveler. Like he leaves Love his body. And this. he's he teaches at a university in the UK. Like it's not, you know, woo. It's like literally he teaches how to do this and talks about it. And, you know, he chose a vegan diet and we had talked about why and he said like you know for those on like a spiritual practice he's found that like the a diet that promotes like peace and kindness is the way and it's and that's why i'm like you can the, there will be chapters of your life where you need to go deep there and then there'll maybe be chapters where you have to apply that knowledge and so then maybe it's like you know, incorporating animal-based foods, whatever you decide to do. But I just think it's so interesting that you're talking about that inner voice and that it indeed is louder when you are eating mostly plants. I don't think it's a mistake. It's wild. When I was plant-based and I started to see all these things start to happen, I was like, okay, there's no question in my mind. I don't care what anyone else says. They're worried about my protein levels. They're worried about me being malnourished because I'm not eating animals. I'm like, I know how I feel. Yeah. And this is undeniable. Yeah. This is something I've never experienced in my life. And now in this new chapter, I feel feel guided to start incorporating things. And along the way in my journey, I've heard teachers, really well-known spiritual teachers share that at one point they had to be plant-based in order to get to where they were. Get the download. And then they yeah. were able to shift. And then there may be weeks where you go plant-based. And exactly. it's, it's, it's not an all or one. Like you don't have to choose. And I think we approach nutrition with this really black and white lens. Mm -hmm. um, and that's I, I, I don't think that's in anyone's best interest. But it actually speaks to the the why in the beginning of Sakara. So, um, you know, Whitney, my co-founder, and I have known each other since seventh grade. We grew up wow. together, um, have been best friends since then. And uh, at a very early age, she started dealing with cystic acne. Um, I think it started in like this, maybe even the seventh grade for her. And, you know, it was really bad. Like it was extremely painful for her. She had cysts all over her face. She did everything from antibiotics to Accutane. She did this crazy laser. I remember where literally she couldn't leave the house for like 14 days and layers of her skin was just falling off. Um, and I remember someone like asking her, she like was a burn victim, like just, trying so many things. I remember once she moved to New York City, we'd like go to Sephora and spend an hour trying to find like the best cover up. Just like so affected her life and was really in the driver's seat of her life and she tried everything. And every dermatologist kind of just told her the same thing, like you can do an antibiotic or Accutane, like that's really all we've got for you. Um, my story is much more anchored in my relationship to food. Um, you know, at a young age, I have this memory of going to Costco with my mom and hiding diet pills in the cart. Um, and you know, you can't hide anything at Costco cause it's always like 10,000 pills. So my mom found it. So that was like the first time I had to confront it to someone, this kind of desire of mine to be what I thought I was supposed to be in order to be valued in the world. Um, and how that manifested for me over the next decade or so was I tried every single diet under the sun. Um, you know, literally every single one. And I learned how to count calories and carbs and points and pounds and I never learned how to build a body that I felt really good in because um, it was never about that. It was always about weight loss, never about vitality and health. Um, and so I had this kind of gap in my mind where it was like my best body equals suffering, my best body equals dieting, my best body, you know, equals something that like doesn't 
like I can never have my best body and feel good. That was like a core belief that I had from all those years of dieting. Um, fast forward, I went to college. It's wild, right? It's wild. And it's, it's one of the things like the diet industry wants you to believe um, that you have to suffer through things. So, you know, I moved to New York City. I, I studied, I wanted to study medicine, so I came here. I did pre-med, um, and then I worked at a hospital up in Harlem for a couple of years. I worked with a cardiologist, and we saw patients with late-stage lifestyle diseases. And around the same time, you know, my dieting was at an all-time worse. It's like you're, you're so busy as a pre-med student and then working in a hospital. I didn't know how to take care of myself. So even if I had had the time, like, I didn't know how. So my health was just kind of falling apart. I... I was diagnosed with IBS, which is, you know, really an umbrella term for like, we don't know, but it seems to be isolated in the gut or like centered in the gut. Um, and uh, the only thing doctors really offer you is medication. A lot of them don't even offer kind of nutritional therapy or points of view, and that's because they're not trained in it. And so I just had this epiphany seeing patients with these chronic lifestyle diseases and no one was talking about their lifestyle. And a lot of times, so sadly, of these patients were so late stage that it was no longer a lifestyle yeah. question. Yeah. It was like, thank God for surgical and pharmaceutical yeah. intervention. But I just thought, like, I'm on this path of needing pharmaceutical or surgical intervention if I don't figure this out. And I want to be more upstream. I want to, like, help people figure out before it's a chronic disease or, you know, even when it is a chronic disease, what their, their dials are. So... I finished my pre-med, but then I, I decided to do nutrition school instead of med school. And I was really lucky that at the time it was, you know, 2009. And that was really some of the beginning blossoming of the, the literature and the science behind the gut. Um, and so we were learning a lot about the microbiome um, and how it could potentially be this epicenter of health. Um, and that we'd basically been bombing it for the past 80 years with antibiotics and herbicides and pesticides and chlorine in our water and what that meant for overall health, um, also ultra processed foods. And it turns, it turned out that like how you eat for a healthy gut is like how you just eat for a healthy body, which is the nice thing. It's like when you really dig into the literature, there are so many commonalities across like eating for mental health, eating for gut health, eating for cardiovascular health. Um, and it was, you know, what Saqqara is. It was getting enough greens, getting enough diversity, getting enough, a balance of protein and fat. And I thought, like, this seems easy, but then when I went to go apply those to my own routines, it was so hard. It was yeah. what we talked about. Yeah. Going to the grocery store, you know, even the farmer's market, advocating, like, is this organic, asking the tough questions, going home and cooking, making sure I'm not just cooking the same thing over and over again. Um, you know, throwing out bad produce, et cetera, et cetera. And so, you know, Whitney was working on Wall Street at the time and her acne was just at an all time worse. And I was like, we both are hitting our rock bottom. Something has to change. And we decided to really dedicate time to this way of eating that we were going to like, didn't matter. Like we were just going to do it for breakfast, lunch and dinner for a month. We were like, let's just give ourselves a month. And we kind of traded off you know, uh, cooking. And it was so fast, as you said, like the impact was so fast that it completely changed our life paths. Like for me, I realized I had been so worried about, you know, dieting and, and my kind of aesthetic appearance and I had lost my way in realizing that the whole point of food is to actually make you feel better. And in diet culture, you're taught that food is the enemy. Um, so it completely like renegotiated my relationship to my plate and that every time I sat down was an opportunity to feel better. Um, and that it was like the tool to helping me not only feel better, but also look better for Whitney you know, she, after a month, it was the first time in her entire life that the inflammation in her skin started to go down. And I'd say for her, it took about six months for the acne to go away, but she saw like more promising results on a month of cigar than she saw in probably 12 years of, you know, wow. medical intervention. And when you say on a month of cigar, it's like what you guys were creating. Yes. At and no one else is having this yet. Just you guys. Yeah. No, yeah. No, no. It's just us. It's not even a business. It's yeah. just us. But after a month, we were like, oh, my God, this is so powerful. 
It's like, maybe we, maybe we like just give this to one other person. Like that'd be cool. (laughs) Um, and so we did. And, you know, also people around us were like, you look different. What are you doing? And then we'd start to tell them and they'd say, oh, we want it. And okay, we'll make a little bit more. And then we just thought, this is something we're in our mid twenties at the time, never went to business school, have no idea how to build a business, but the mission was so clear to us. Like we want to help make healthy eating and really like transform lives through the power of food as medicine. And we want to make that as easy for people as possible. And even now, you know, now I'm getting my master's in functional medicine and you learn very early on that you can have all the answers for a patient. You can literally say, take this pill, it will fix you, which we could, never is actually the truth, but let's just pretend for a moment that it is still adherence to taking the pill every single day is so low. So like, even when something is easy to do, it's still like hard to get patients to do it. And so that's the moment where like, we can't just tell people what to eat. We have to provide it. Um, so it's like almost foolproof. And that put us on this mission. And that was 2011, 12, um, and wow. it sounds so like quaint and cute at the time. It was really hard, but, um, I'm, I'm we started right cooking ourselves, like, delivering on our bicycles, that. literally started it by throwing a, a dinner party and raising $700 off of ticket sales. And that was how we built our own website. We like bought some marketing cards and like just put them around and got like our first 10 clients. Um, and that's how we started and we were cooking in our own kitchens, which was probably illegal. (laughs) We just kept going. Um, and then 10 turned into 20 and we had to like find a kitchen to rent and then delivery people. And it just, you know, built over time. Um, and looking back, it was incredibly quickly. Um, and yeah, and just put us on this mission. So now, you know, we have over 300 employees and we deliver to all 48 states, like continental states, except Hawaii and Alaska. I know as I was thinking, like you definitely chose the harder route. Like you could have yeah. wrote a recipe book. No, 100%. We joke. We're a like, plan. yeah, couldn't we just put like a book in a box? And like but you that. knew what people needed. And I'm yeah. sitting here feeling so grateful that you chose that route. And I'm sure so many people and who have too. tried the meals I mean, feel when that way. On the days where like for whatever reason I can't get a delivery, I'm like, I don't know how people – go out into the world and advocate for their health every single day for every single meal. It's exhausting. Yeah. Like finding a place that you can go grab a quick bite, but also is healthy. You know, it's just like, it's really hard to, to look out for your health out in the world. Yes. It really is. Who were the first 10 people that came to the events? Friends? Friends. Love your Friends. And then circle. we told everyone to like invite, you know, a friend. Or two. A friend. Yeah. Nice. Um, yeah. And I think we charged like 120 bucks, which is, really expensive at the time, but we like paired it with organic wines and such. Okay. So, um, yeah. And I think we like actually had people make some of the food. It was, it was fun while they were there while they were there. Yeah. Um, and we like would educate on the ingredients in it and why. Um, so I think for us, it was a really early indicator on the importance of community, yeah. which we're so grateful you're a part of. Um, and just, you know, it started with my story. It started with Whitney's story, but now we have thousands, like tens of thousands of stories. And, I always tell people sharing your story about how this food changed your life is like an act of service because sometimes people don't know that they're okay just feeling okay. Or sometimes they don't know that, you know, food can be the thing that will transform their lives. And you sharing your story is just such a critical part of that transformation for people because people might not see themselves in my story, but they might see themselves in your story. Yeah, that's so true. And I think we're used to what we're used to. And until we have that awareness to Mm -hmm. the idea that something else can exist and I could, I could actually feel great. I don't have to feel okay. I could feel amazing. Yeah. You have permission. And it's all about what we consume Mm -hmm. in every aspect. Where was the dinner party? Did you like rent a space? Yeah, it was just really, really no, yeah, it was actually so funny you ask because I just walked by it the other day. I haven't walked by it in years. I it was love this that. little wine store on South Street Seaport and they have this really beautiful back room um, and all of the buildings down at South Street Seaport are so historic. Um, so it was a little room and they had just had this long, beautiful wooden table and it was a wine store. So they like helped us pair all the, beautiful. all the wine. Yeah. I know we should do like a throwback dinner. Party That's there. amazing. <laughs> you should. That's really special. Yeah. It was lovely. So I know you brought up organic from then as well. So it was just as important to you then to have organic produce. I mean, it's critical now. and, and you know, it's, it's so unfortunate that 
a lot of, you know, the conversations around organic are, you know, around privilege and price. And when in reality, every human on the planet deserves to have, you know, like organic still has pesticides. I think every human on the planet has right to like have pesticide, chemical free food. Um, but that's not part of the conversation. But I think, you know, what Whitney and I believe is the more we can, you know, we're a big part of the food supply chain now. So like we're buying tons, not like, like literal tons of organic produce. And so we're increasing demand, which, you know, increases profits for farmers, which increases the likelihood that new farmers will come along or that old farmers um, who typically have not been practicing organic will make the switch. So I think the more you can, and we've, and we've shown in the past decade that consumers have a huge impact, bigger than, than we thought. I mean, dairy sales are way down. Um, so, you know, we have an impact. And so our hope is like the more we are all demanding of quality, that the more they'll, they'll be able to provide it. Yeah. Wow. I definitely wasn't eating organic then when you guys started, but now I know the importance. And even yeah. now I'm like, how organic is organic? I, oh I mean, so it's so important that we have that at least. Yeah. And because of the convention, that's like bare minimum. And then a lot of the farmers we work with are beyond organic, um, wow. which just means like regenerative farming where, you know, the, if you support the cycles of nature, you actually don't have to intervene as much as we humans think that we yeah. need to. Um, and you know, it's tough. It's, it's, it's not as simple as I'm making it. Of course, like, Agriculture is a really difficult business. We have a lot of people on the planet, um, and so it requires, you know, some creativity. But there are lots of options that also aren't endocrine disruptors. Yeah, um, it's just making those switches at this at this kind of scale are, are diff- is difficult. Yeah, it feels when I receive your products, it just feels organic. Like everything about it feels vibrant. It the feels vibes healing. are healing. It feels healthy. I mean, our kitchen team, our operations team is just one of like the most special groups, group of humans like I've, I've honestly ever known. They, you know, we were deemed a, a necessary business during COVID, um, which, you know, because we were making food and yeah. people couldn't go to grocery stores. And so, you know, the, a lot of our team, got to work from home and across Zoom, but that team did not. And though it was really scary for a while and we didn't know, you know, what was this pandemic? What are we going to do? That team is so incredibly bonded. Like they've literally lived through a pandemic together, been on the front lines together. um, And it's just so beautiful to see like how much love they bring to their work and to the food. And you feel that like, you can't deny that the way something is made matters. Like you just really can't. It it really, really matters and intention matters and kind of making sure the people who are making the food want to be there and understand the impact they have, uh, it, it matters. It totally matters. And the more we wake up to that awareness, we feel it, we sense it. Yeah. And there was a time where especially during the pandemic where I was cooking all my own food and I was thinking, oh my gosh, it's amazing. It's my energy. I'm playing mantra Mm -hmm. while I'm cooking. This is beautiful. And then the contrast of like ordering in from a restaurant yeah. and then you order Sakar and you're like, the energy is here. Like you just know, you feel it yeah, and you feel it in your energy level as you, you eat it, you consume it, you digest it. And it's, it's absolutely there. And that's something I'm really grateful for because it's like, the guilt free of bringing it totally because yeah. the energy is there. Yeah, that's right. What was your kind of early like? Why did you make that switch to plant based? So I dealt with anxiety most of my life. Mm. A lot of it, I think, was actually learned. Mm-hmm. Like this idea that to you love have to worry. you have to worry, and that aspect was definitely learned. And then I remember watching my aunt who always worried about her health, mm. and she was always healthy. And I thought like, oh, if I worry everything will be okay mm. because what you're thinking about won't actually happen. Like weird. No, I, I So hear that. it was, a lot of it was learned. Um, but then it developed into panic attacks mm. where I, my heart would just race. I turned white and I would have to call my mom and be like, I'm having a panic attack. And I would have to hear her be like, you are okay. Relax. And then I would just be fine. Um, 
and I know someone who I worked with. I used to be an elementary school teacher. Oh, wow. And a teacher I worked with had a ridiculous healing story, like miraculous healing story from going plant-based. Wow. And I have an Aquarius moon. So if you want to tell me anything that's a little <laughs> woo-woo and out there before like it's commonly accepted, I'm in it. Yeah. And I'm ready. Like I'm there. <laughs> so I started to talk to him. I was always interested in his story, but like I never really asked him about it. And then we went on a field trip together with our classes. I'm like, this is my chance. <laughs> so I got right in there. Yeah. And I'm a very passionate person. And I was just like, this sounds good. Mm. And so I just slowly started making changes. He really helped me. Um, and and that was when? 2017. Okay. Wow. And then shortly after that, I found meditation. And shortly after that, I became trained in it. And then just knew I had to follow this path, like, wholeheartedly, completely. You and a lot of other things. You to the classroom, to too. Yes. Yes. I hope you do that. Well, I'm not a teacher anymore. But yeah. when I was there, I did share a lot. And what I noticed was there's such a disconnection yeah. from our food source and how children Gosh. really don't understand where their food's coming from. And we we don't really either, unless we want to dive into like those <laughs> dark rabbit holes. But it's just this disconnection. And the more we can talk about it and the more we could be conscious, make these conscious decisions, especially from an early age, it's really impactful. Yeah, we do a lot of work with uh, wellness in the schools um, who – like their kind of whole aim is to help educate children in New York City public schools about their options, like their health options. That's amazing. Um, so like what is it, what is a whole food? And like they'll bring in, you know, whole foods. They probably don't see that often. They'll do cooking classes. They do, you know, like yoga classes and things like that. And we actually just worked with them to design a lot of the plant-based menu items that are going to be um, – made at public school. So like the wow. kids are eating a lot of our Saqqara oh recipes. My gosh. I know. It's amazing. But let me tell you, like oh. on this topic, as a mother, those kids in school in Manhattan, like it's so awful. Like I cannot believe and I and I know the administrators, like they have such good intent. They're in the field of like childhood development. Yeah. They deeply care about children mm -hmm. but just so don't understand the impact of nutrition choices on childhood development and I'm just like I literally feel like I'm talking to brick walls and I I I took one of the administrators grocery shopping and I was like you can try this instead of this and this is why I wouldn't put this snack in the classroom mm -hmm. And still, like, no change. Like, And I, I showed them, you know, you can order off of Thrive a lot of these snacks. Like, there are ways to make it easy and still, still no change. And you know what I realized is that until we value health and nutrition as a society, it's not going to show up in the school system because it has to be a core value because the schools have core values and you see it. You see mm -hmm. it manifest in the yep. classroom. But like until nutrition is a core value, it's an afterthought. It's like, oh, it's snack time. Let's just give yeah. them something. Yeah. And it's just so heartbreaking. And also how it impacts the brain because of the gut-brain connection and yeah. also their energy levels and their attention levels. It's all connected. And you're giving these kids like such sugary yeah. snacks, such ultra-processed food. And then like then you're telling them that they're too, you know, yes. rambunctious in yes. class. Or, and I'm just like, it's connected. And we can't yeah. deny that it's connected. And until anyway, we I could really see Stand that. on my soapbox for a while on this topic. Yeah. And it's about that awakening and the awareness and we're grateful to be in the place that we are where we have the awareness and i think it's taking some time but it's a matter of time for our, everyone to buy in yeah like i know there's mindfulness now in the city yeah i used to teach for the doe too oh amazing so i taught in the bronx for three years oh so, um, cool. so I'm familiar with like the cafeteria food for sure yeah and also like it's not it's it's resources too. It's like, you know, we have to give schools more resources. Yes. It's like if you don't want them to serve chips, then you have to give them the resources to make, I don't know, sweet potatoes, like roasted yeah. sweet potatoes. That takes time and that yeah. takes people to do that. And so like that's that that's those are really hard shifts for schools, anyone, any organization to make. Um so true. but especially schools. Yeah, it's so true. 
So I know that you brought up being a mother. Yeah. And I would love to hear. I love watching everything you share. Oh, thank your you. Your children, like thank the balance so of work and life. How do you do it? What are your tips? <laughs> I mean, my first like thing is like I just never think about balance because I think it's something that um, like I just don't know what it is. I really don't know what balance is. So I more... It looks like you have it, though. I mean, I more <laughs> seek joy yeah. and get really clear, continuously have a practice of getting clear on my boundaries. And, and, you know, like I have one where I'm home for dinner every night, unless I have like an event or something, but like work-wise, yeah. I'm home for dinner and bedtime every single night. Like, And I don't take calls. I don't do meetings during those times. Are there outliers? Of course. But, like, that's something that brings me some sanity and, like, a rule I've made for myself. Um, you know, I, in terms of balance, like, I truly just – I just try and seek the things that bring me joy. And I think about this actually all the time. You know, I'm a working mother. My kids actually stay home full-time with their dad. And every morning when I have to say bye to my kids – I have to ask myself, like, why am I prioritizing work and time away from them? Um, I could drastically change my life, leave the city, and like not have to, you know, work as hard. Um, and and so I have to ask ask myself this question, and my answer is always like, I I garner a lot of fulfillment from this work, and I know I'm impacting lives. And it brings me joy, and I have to set that example for my kids because I would want them to do that too. Um, and so, you know, I prioritize them in every way, um, and they know that. And also, my work is important, and it's like I don't say, oh, mommy has to go to work, you know, to make money. It's like I go to work because it brings me joy and fulfillment, yeah. and I want them to do that for themselves too. So I think that brings a lot of balance to me too. It might be like psycho-spiritual balance, <laughs> um, but just to know that, that, you know, I am leaving them because I'm doing something that also brings me joy. Um, and also, you know, very privileged that one parent gets to stay home with them. Like, I can't act like, you know, my sanity isn't also due to, you know, the privilege that I do have. Um, and I'm really grateful that my kids get to be with, you know, another parent. I might feel differently if I had to hire someone or, you know, put them somewhere so like I also recognize that some of that sanity is brought because of the immense privilege I have to like let my husband do what he wants to do which is to stay home with the children yeah that's so beautiful you're so humble and aware oh, of so thank much you. thank like, you you have such deep awareness and it's like it's so amazing to be a witness of Thank you. It's really I special really though. That. And I think everything is perspective. And to be able each morning to have that clarity of like why you're yeah. continuing that. So I wanted to go back to that jump from like the beginning stage into closer to what you have now. Because I I created a community and a business for myself and I'm always so curious. Like it's all a how blur. How did it expand? You know, I just like had both Whitney and I just were so heads down. Like if we're going to, we have a really big vision. Yeah. Um, and just kept going. Like she and I talk about this all the time, that tenacity and not giving up is 80% of success mm -hmm. because you're presented with so many excuses to give up so many reasons to just throw in the towel. Um, that you just have to keep going. And that's why I tell people find your mission, which is just so different than your passion. Because mm -hmm. your passion is something you probably like doing and it brings you some joy, but like your mission wakes you up in the middle of the night. Like you must continue on. Just. And yeah, and like knowing you're impacting lives is just the greatest gift and the greatest kind of inspiration for me and Whitney. Yeah. Um, and so even in the hardest moments, it allowed us to know that our, this work was a far bigger than she and I. Um, and then I'll also say like team, like obviously there's just no way we would be here without, you know, our incredible team. And you learn that early on, like people love telling you that, like it's, uh, you know, A plus team is so important. Um, but like the lived experience of that just like couldn't be farther from the truth and recognizing how lucky you are when you get 
great people on your team. And I know a lot of people on your team and it like lives and breathes with them within them too. It's, yeah. They're very aligned on the mission. Yeah. We do team surveys and it's like a hundred percent of our team believes in the mission, which yeah. our head of HR was like, I've never seen this before. Really? <laughs> That's yeah. so cool. And I totally believe it just from the few, the handful of people I know yeah. on the team. I believe that for sure. And it's one of the reasons I really appreciate this like next generation mm-hmm. because they almost like they value what their work is doing more than they value like the hustle. Mm -hmm. And it's not that you have to choose between the two. And I think that's actually what they're defining for us is like, you know, my work and my time is valuable. And also like it has to be doing something good in the world. Um, And I really, I really value that about this generation where it's like non-negotiable for them. Yeah, it's a huge to be aligned, like personally aligned with their work. Yes, it's amazing to see because for so long I personally struggled with that. Yeah, I told you I was a teacher. Yeah, which was wonderful. It brought me so many blessings, so much wisdom and experience. But I knew there was something else meant for me. But I also knew how important it was to have a secure job and have the benefits and have the, you know, the pension and all the things, and then have to do a ton of like breaking the patterns and what's been imposed upon me to get to like my truth and my mission. And it was hard, but I, I agree. I think this leading generation is definitely defining that for us and it's exciting to see and watch. And yeah. it's also fun to hear like perspective from other generations, like talk shit about yeah. it. And I'm like, oh no, 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 don't talk shit about them. They know, they, they know. get it. And look, we're all they standing on the shoulders of prior <laughs> generations and exactly. so you know, they wouldn't be able, they wouldn't have the luxury of taking this stance maybe without the work of our generation and generations before that. But like, you can still appreciate that they're light years ahead in that way. Like, it's so true. It's gratitude for everyone who paved the way for us to be here and be able to follow a mission and live a life that feels good. Yeah. That That feels like flow. Yeah. 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 I don't remember who talks about this but this idea like the concentric circles and where they overlap and you know you can find what you're really good at and then you can find what you love doing and then like what are you in service to like what what is the good you're bringing to the world and the place where those overlap is your work I love that and trying to and that's like your mission and I think a really critical component of mission is that being in service and I think mission sadly has kind of been hijacked (laughs) Um, but you know, it's like every single brand maybe can't have like a super aligned mission, but if you can find it personally, Mm -hmm. um, I think that that's like the greatest gift you can give yourself. Yeah. Because it's, it's not as if finding your mission has to be, go be an entrepreneur by any means. I mean, even just look at our team who's so aligned on their personal missions and is also working for a company and amazing companies can't do beautiful work in the world without an amazing team so true yeah that's so true i listen to ed milet a lot do you know him Mm -mm. i like recently became obsessed with him and today he was saying how i'll probably just destroy his quote but basically like leaders are here to assist other people who have dreams Mm. but it was better than that but it reminded me like a lot of what you said is what I heard today in his conversation on following your dream and being a leader and following that mission and figuring out the role you play because like transformative companies happen not with one person Mm -hmm. like it happens with people who want to be a part of that mission too and find their role some people some people's role is, yeah, on the operation side of that mission. Some people's role is on the brand side of that that mission. And I think there was a while there where it was like entrepreneur or bust. Like you can't be as successful unless you just like start your own business. And I hope that that has changed yeah. um, because I think what happened in that is it was like celebritized and mm-hmm. and no one talked enough about how hard it is to be an entrepreneur and also how critical it is to, you know, find to like, in order to build that company, you have to find the right team. So I hope we've kind of come off of that trend of like, you have to be an entrepreneur and more too, you have to find that 
where those concentric circles meet. Yes. And that could be your own brand, but it could also be finding a, a, a brand that's in, ser- in service in the way you want to be in service in the world. Yeah, it's so true. It's so true. And I think sometimes there's there's so much to say about being um, I remember when I was administ- at administrative school, I went to school while I was teaching to be an administrator and there was this thing about like first followers. And now I feel like followers have like a bad con- connotation, but this wasn't at all. It was a really positive thing where there's a leader and there's that first person that's yes. like, I want to be on this Early team. adopters. I wanna, yeah. yeah. I want to support you. And without them, where would any leader really be or any company really be? So it's so true and it's so important. A hundred percent. I mean, so early on, like it was exactly what you said. Whitney and I had the dream. But then we had to find the people who could help us get there, Yeah, who could like see the dream with us, but weren't the dreamers, mm-hmm. were the people that were going to go build the kitchen, yeah. were the people who were going to go, you know, source the produce. Yes. And those are very different skills than what Whitney and I had, but equally as important. How do you go about sourcing the food? So I know you mentioned farmers. Yeah. So I mean, we have direct- a procurement team. It's our full time job. Um, you know, connecting with farmers, working with farmers, because typically if you're a really good farmer, you don't have the tech in place to like Mm -hmm. make it easy to order. (laughs) Um, I remember early on Whitney and I would find these amazing farms and be like getting in touch with the farmers was so hard. (laughs) And so you literally just had to show up to the farm and be like, hey, I'm here. We're ordering your produce. I could totally see it. Yeah. Um, So yeah, we, I mean, we have a full time team and, you know, they, they look for, you know, farmers who are doing it the right way, who care, who care about planet earth, who care about their employees, who care about, you know, the impact you talk about the energy you feel from people making the food. I mean, think about the energy from the people growing and harvesting our food. Mm -hmm. It really, it all matters from seed all the way to your plate, uh, who handled that food. Um, and also early on, we, we knew we wanted to shorten the time that, food set on the shelf. Um, and so like when you think about a grocery store, like these big grocery stores are sourcing from big farms, um, you know, sometimes like thousands of miles away. So then it's the time from harvest to the time to it even gets to which, what is probably some level of like a warehouse that then it gets sent to the grocery store and then it sits in the grocery store and then the, the grocery store gets put on the shelf at the grocery store. And then a couple of days until you buy it, and then you buy it, and it probably sits in your shelf, yeah. your refrigerator for a so few days. True. A long time from harvest to consumption, um, and so we, you know, there's a lot of people, brands like you can work with to get produce, you know, uh, like a B two B business. And though we use that, of course, sometimes, especially for dry goods, for the fresh food, we really wanted to work directly with farmers. Yeah. So you can shorten that window, um, not only for freshness, but also supporting farmers directly. Beautiful. That's incredible. Yeah. And that, again, contributes to the energy you feel yeah. as you the see the food, as you eat food. it. Yeah. 100%. And even how and it lasts freshness. in your fridge. Yeah, yes. the freshness. And you'll notice, like... Our meals, like the food you're getting in our meals is fresher than what you'll find at the grocery store. Mm -hmm. So sometimes people are worried like, oh, well, my meal lasts till Wednesday. And it's like, you probably wouldn't even gotten it from the grocery store until the following Sunday. So yes, you know, like even if you eat it on, it gets delivered on Monday and you eat it on Wednesday, it's still way fresher than what you'd find at the grocery store. So true. Yeah. You seem very spiritually aligned, spiritually in tuned, Mm -hmm. connected to your higher self. And I know... I love your podcast and the Thank guests you. you've had. Joe so Dispenza. Fun. That was a really big one. Yeah, that was so exciting. Was so, one of my favorite He was episodes. great. He did not disappoint. <laughs> I sent that episode to so many people. And I, shortly after, I went to his advanced retreat. Oh, you did? Yeah. I'm dying to do one of yeah. his retreats. We actually talked great. about, I don't know if I can say this, we talked about a, doing a retreat with him, like a Saqqara. Because oh like, imagine if you had like the best food. And I mean, back to our earlier point, yes. like spiritual alignment and food matters. Yeah. Yeah. So when you brought up the astral traveling, I need to ask you, like, do you astral travel? You know, (laughs) no. uh, I I always have this idea that, like, I'm going to retire someday and then, like, do all that stuff. Yeah. But I think it takes a quiet life to go there. At least for me personally, it Uh would. Like, I can't imagine going to work all day, making dinner for my kids, putting them down, and then, like, sitting down and astral traveling. It just feels very far away. Um, 
but 101% believe in all of that, believe that every human on this planet has the right to all of those experiences and not only the right, but the capability. Um, it's just like learning. And I think a lot of, a lot more quiet time. Um, I don't know if you've ever read the book Spirit Babies. No, but it's actually on my list. I highly recommend it for everyone, whether or not you want to have children. Um, but it's, it's written by a medium who sadly passed, but you know, he talks about how some mediums speak to those that have passed. Some mediums talk to, you know, guardian angels or angel like figures. And he realized through something like a 12 hour meditation that the spirits that he talked to were actually spirits that were about to come into the world. Wow. And it's a really powerful book. Um, but all to say, like, it was 12 hours of silence. Yeah. And just like, when was the last time any of us sat in 12 hours? I mean, just 12 minutes of silence. Yeah. We're lucky if we get in. So I think a lot of the kind of spiritual alignment I'm looking forward to in my life, even though I have, you know, my own practices and alignment, I, I feel aligned. I think will happen later in life just because it requires so much kind of solitude and quiet. And I have two young kids and a business. It's just not my time, but there will be a time where I dedicate more time to that. Well, I look at you and I feel like you're very spiritually aligned and it seems like you have a really deep practice. Can you share a little bit about what your practices look like? Yeah. I mean, I wish it were something that like I could share. Like I don't, I'm not someone who sits down to meditate every single day. Um, I'm, I'm very much question all of my thoughts and all of my actions with like, is this who I want to be? Mm -hmm. Is this aligned? So I bring that POV to everything I do at all and think at all times um, with a really kind of curious, non-judgmental inner voice. Yeah. Um, so I'm not constantly critiquing myself. I'm just constantly asking if this is a reflection of the person I want to be in my highest good. So I would call that a big spiritual practice. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm very, very lucky to have a deep, deep well of sisters, like women who are, you know, witches and goddesses and just energy healers and energy movers who just being around them is a spiritual practice yeah. and the conversations that I feel very lucky to partake in. Um, and that sisterhood in and of itself is such a spiritual practice and having those deep, deep, meaningful relationships. Um, and, you know, Whitney be definitely being one of them. And then also just having kids is such a spiritual practice. <laughs> I'm sure. Every day, every moment. Um, what it means to, to be patient. What it means to come up against my core beliefs. What it means to come up against my own triggers and how I was raised and what I want to do differently or things I didn't even know about myself. And um, early on, I studied Kabbalah. And though I don't study it actively anymore, some of the core teachings I will never forget and are just in me. And one of them is um, being proactive instead of reactive in every moment. So the kind of telltale example is you're in traffic. You have two options. You can be really stressed because you're going to be late or you can be proactive and, you know, get to that book you've been meaning to listen to on tape. Um, call your mom uh, and remembering that in every moment you have that option. Um, and that has been a huge spiritual practice of mine for a really long time. Yeah. I love that so much. It's hard. It's really hard. Yeah. Yeah. But I love that. And you, I look at you as so embodied and you just, mm -hmm. you are your practice Thank and your practice you. is you. And I love the perspective on your friends and the well of sisterhood that you have because it's so true. Like what happens when we connect with another being who truly sees us or even challenges us, who helps to be, be a mirror, yeah. who helps us to go into the depths that maybe we've never been to before, shifting our perspective. It's so true. And that is such a beautiful spiritual practice it's to have. It's such a gift. Like sometimes I'll just like text girlfriends of mine like Monday musings and it'll be like the most abstract thought I had and we'll just all day go off on this text exchange. And it's, it's it's like church yeah you know and you're totally right like they bring perspectives that i don't and yeah it's i feel very fortunate so beautiful yeah. thank you for sharing that yeah of course do you have any plans in the future for sakara that oh, you'd man. like to share um or anything upcoming you know the fall reset was amazing yeah i mean so good so good i think so we have january coming up which is 
a time where I don't know, like the culture has just taught us quick, take care of yourself. Yeah. Um, and it's not with judgment. I say that because I'm just grateful that at least there's a time. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I feel you. I totally society feel you. says like, it's okay to take care of yourself now. Um, <laughs> So I always look forward to that time because it's like our moment in the sunshine where we get to reinforce that and people actually want to hear it. The rest of the year, people are like, yeah, yeah, I want to take care of myself, but I'm busy. And so it just takes a little bit more seduction to help people understand like every day is your time. Um, so I always look forward to that. We'll do, you know, we do these four week resets four time, three times a year. And so January is one of them. So I just personally look forward to it because I do it. We do it with our community. Um, and speaking of, you know, sisterhood and community, like doing that with a community is just so empowering. And you also get to hear other people's experiences and transformations, which is so inspiring. And I think future forward, you know, it's our meals, being your personal chef and your nutritionist all in one, it's so expensive for us. So it has to be expensive for the consumer. And we know that not everyone can afford it. And our mission and vision is much bigger than being able to just service people who can afford this food. So thinking about like, what are the products that would make eating this way much, much easier for people? So, you know, really working on our innovation pipeline and over the next, I'd say like 18 months, really focusing on some of those easy wins for people because it actually doesn't have to be complicated. You just need things that make it easier. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's so exciting. Yeah. I can't thank you enough for all that you bring and Whitney as well. Just all that you guys bring. Well, your support just means the world to us and you you have such a powerful voice. So thank Thank you you for using it for all the good. Thank you so much. If anyone here would like to follow you or tune into your podcast, can you share all the info? Yeah. So um, our podcast is called the Sakara Life Podcast. Uh, Instagram is at Sakara Life. And for me, it's at Danielle Dubois. Amazing. Thank yeah. you. I can't thank you enough for making time. Thank you. Thank you today. for having me. I so appreciate thank you. it. Thank you. Thank you guys so much. I hope you enjoyed this conversation as much as I did. It was such a pleasure to sit down with Danielle. She really is just a soulful, humble and deeply connected individual. And it was an absolute honor to have this time with her. If you're interested in trying Sakara, especially if you never have before, I get, I get 20% off to community members for their first time purchase with the code XOERICAP. But regardless, if you tried it already, I'm sure that you're just in the mood to refresh your refrigerator, your diet, with the Sakara experience. I highly recommend trying it. And as Danielle shared, which came at the perfect time, it's not about veganism. It's just about a plant forward and a plant focused diet, which means tons of plants and anything else you enjoy and adding that in along the way. I personally love getting their lunches and their dinners. It, for me, I just feel like that's where I'm always in need. Breakfasts are pretty easy for me, but I will say the times that I get their breakfast, lunch, and dinner, I love their breakfast for a late breakfast or even for a snack mid or end of day. It's all so delicious and I hope that you try it if you haven't yet. So thank you for being here. I hope you enjoyed the conversation and I'll see you next time.